What does the Bible say about God? As we have seen, it says a great deal. God is the author. What does the Bible say about Jesus? As we have seen, it says a great deal. Jesus is the word become flesh. What does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? As we have seen, it says a great deal. The Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the Bible. This morning I ask, what does the Bible say about us? I think you know the answer. It says a great deal. The Bible was written for us and about us. The Bible says we were created by God. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. <clears throat> then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. When we say, what does the Bible say about us? We're, of course, saying, what does the Bible say about man? Or more correctly, mankind, male and females. When God says, let us make man in our image, our own image, he is not referring to a physical similarity. God is spirit. We have the ability, because we are made in the image of God, to reason. We have the ability to make moral decisions. We have the ability to love. There are qualities that we have that animals do not have because we are made in the image of God. <clears throat> now, not everybody looks at it this way. An ingenious chemist once analyzed the human body as containing enough fat to make seven bars of soap, enough iron for a medium-sized nail, enough sugar to fill a shaker, enough lime to whitewash a dog, uh, to wash a dog house, enough phosphorus to make 2,200 match tips, enough magnesium for one medical dosage, and enough potassium to explode a toy cannon, enough sulfur to rid a dog of fleas, enough salt to pickle a pound of pork, and he estimated the total drugstore value at $1.98. Well, I suppose the value has increased over the years. I think this is a very old illustration. But he was simply looking at the different things that make up our physical body. Leslie Stevenson, a reader in logic and metaphysics at St. Andrews University in Scotland said, man is nothing more than a glutinated dust. No hope rest here. Well, that is the worldview of us. That is looking at our physical bodies. A body that is born, we grow, we mature, we begin to fall apart, we eventually die. But the Bible presents a far different picture of us. We are made in the very image of God. No, we are not animals. We have some similarities with different animals, especially the mammals. But we notice in verses 26 and 27, that as God says, let us make man in our image, he says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, stock, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the land. God made man, last of all, and put mankind in charge of all the other creation. That is a great responsibility as well as a great privilege. The world was made for us. In 2012, a federal judge in San Diego dismissed an unprecedented lawsuit seeking to grant constitutional protection 
against slavery to a group of orcas that perform at SeaWorld parks, saying the 13th Amendment applies only to humans. U.S. District Judge Jeffrey Miller stopped the case from proceeding two days after he became the first judge in U.S. history to listen to arguments in court over the possibility of granting constitutional rights for members of an animal species. He said as slavery and involuntary servitude are uniquely human activities, as those terms have been historically and contemporaneously applied, there is simply no basis to construe the 13th Amendment as applying to non-humans. I'm not sure what would happen in the courts today, but I do know what God said long ago. He made the animals, and then he made us, and he put us over the animals. We also see from the Bible that we have a soul. We are more than our physical bodies. They are wondrous. But we are more than that. The word soul is used quite a number of times in Scripture, used in different ways. But I point you to three texts. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Jesus is speaking about the spiritual part of us, the part that is going to live on after this body dies. James, in his letter, chapter 1, verse 21, says, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. We need salvation. There is the part of us that's going to live beyond this life that needs to be saved. Jesus again, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We do, to some degree, take care of our physical bodies, some of us better than others. We would like for them to last us a while, and with care they usually do. We realize that this body has an expiration date. But God made us, unlike animals, with a part that's going to live on, our soul. The Bible says we were made male and female. Genesis chapter 2 beginning with verse 18, reading through verse 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called them, every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and were not ashamed. Now, we need not think, and it would be incorrect to think, that God did the creation week, that he made man, he thought he was through, then he realized, oops, I didn't make a helper for the man. No, God had everything figured out way in advance of when he did it. But he saw that the man was alone, that there was not someone suitable for him. 
He had created Adam, man, out of the dust. But he took a rib out of Adam and made woman, Eve. And notice that it is very clearly stated. We've already read in the beginning text. God made man, male and female, created he them. He made the man and the woman for each other. And when they do enter into marriage, they become one. Jesus will refer to the end of Genesis in his own teaching. It says, don't let man separate what God has joined together. I've had the experience just recently and again in the last couple of years of seeing what happens when that marriage comes to an end because of the death of one of the spouses. The two had become one. And with the death of the spouse, it doesn't go back to what it was before. Because a part of what the person was is ripped away with the death of the spouse. God's design, and let's remember God made us. And he wrote the book to guide us. God's design is that there are two genders. And in the words of Forrest Gump, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> the Bible says we need a Savior. We all sin. Because of sin, we are not what we were designed to be. When God made us, we were sinless. Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden. They had not sinned. They were told to take care of the garden. They were given one prohibition. You must not eat the fruit of that tree, the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you do, if you do, you will die. And along comes that serpent. He says to Eve, well, what did God say to you about this? He said, we can't eat the fruit of that tree. We'll die. The servant says, God's just keeping something from you. He says, when you eat the fruit of that tree, he knows you'll be like God. And sadly, too often, man wants to be like God, but not in the sense of becoming godly, of becoming holy. So he ate of the fruit. She gave to Adam. He ate of it. And yes, they gained the knowledge of good and evil. But they were no longer sinless. They had disobeyed God. They were no longer suited to live in the Garden of Eden because there was also the tree of life there. And if they ate the fruit of that tree, perhaps they already had been. But if they ate the fruit of that tree, they would live forever. And they were not suited to do so in their sinful condition. And so God cast them out of the garden. He still loved them. He cared for them. As he has cared for all of us. Because you see, it was no surprise to God that Eve ate the fruit and gave it to Adam. It was no surprise to God at all that mankind sinned. He knew that before he ever made us. And he already had the plan in place, already in the works, of how he would bring us back to him. <clears throat> I said we all sin. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We could kind of say, well, you know, that's just a hopeless condition. I'm not what God made me to be. I've sinned. In the 17th century in France, a scholar by the name of Moretus was an ailing fugitive. When he presented himself to the medical doctors, he was dressed in the rags of a pauper. 
The doctors discussed his case in Latin, thinking he would not be able to understand them. One said, let us try an experiment with this worthless creature. Imagine their shock when this pauper replied, also in Latin, Will you call worthless one for whom Christ did not disdain to die? Yes, we sinned. But God made us and God values us. And he sent his son, the word become flesh, to die for us. We've all sinned, but we have a Savior. Jesus is our Savior. You know, the value of anything is clearly shown by its purchase price. And our exact worth was declared to us on the cross of Calvary. This is the cost that God paid for each one of us. We read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. There was one way and one way only for our sins to be forgiven, for us to become once again reconciled with God, righteous in the sight of God. And that was for a sinless person to die for all. And the only sinless person that could be found was the Son of God, God become flesh. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were released from sin by the blood of Christ. God loves us. God made the plan to save us. Here's a $20 bill. It's in pretty good shape. It's worth $20, more or less. Now, if I take this nice $20 bill and I crumple it up like this, is it still worth $20? Yes, it is. If I take this $20 bill and I put it on the floor and I just rub it into the floor with my foot, is it still worth $20? Yes, it is. It sure doesn't look as good as it used to, but it's still worth $20. Well, let's think about us. Many times in our lives, we are dropped, crumpled, and ground into the dirt by the decisions we make and the circumstances that come our way. We feel as though we are worthless. But no matter what has happened or what will happen, you and I will never lose our value in God's eyes. To him, dirty or clean, crumpled or finely creased, we are still priceless to him. So priceless that he sent his one and only son to die for us that we might not perish but have eternal life. The Bible also says that we will die. We all know Snoopy, the dog in Charlie Brown cartoon series. One day, Snoopy was on top of his doghouse, and he was saying, I can hear my heart beating. I can hear my stomach growling. I can hear my bones creaking. And then he complained, my body is making so much noise, I can't sleep. As we grow older, <laughs> there seem to be more things that disturb our sleep, more aches and pains. We're getting older. Psychologists tell us that birthdays with zeros behind them are often considered either a blessing or a curse. For instance, we look forward to the birthdays of 10, 20, and 30 as stepping stones on the road to maturity. 
And the 70th, 80th, and 90th birthdays are seen as milestones to a triumphant old age. The birthdays at 40, 50, and 60 are not seen as milestones, but as millstones around our necks. Because that's when we begin to realize that the battle between youthful strength and decay is being won by decay. We learned yesterday of a person who had died of cancer at age 27. That's not the norm. But we're all going to die. The writer of Hebrews says, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. One out of one dies. I've related at least to some individuals a conversation I had with my primary care physician. I have some different health problems. I was discussing with him, well, you know, I really figure I'll die of this rather than that. And he just looked at me very seriously and says, well, I can assure you, you will die of something. That's just what you want to hear from your doctor. But it's true. Unless Jesus comes first, we're all going to die. But there's good news. Death is not the end. We will be raised from the dead with a body suited for eternity. And so God has told us in the Bible how to live in this life so that we can have eternal life with him in that new body. The story is told that Socrates one day was carrying on a conversation with a man from India. As they talked, Socrates said, I'm trying the very best I can to understand man and life. The Indian replied, I ought to tell you now that you will never understand man or life unless you understand man in the light of the God that made him. You cannot understand him without understanding God first of all as the one who has brought him into being. We've looked at God. God made us. God designed us. God has given the instruction book for us on how to live. And if we're going to understand life, if we're going to understand what it means to be us, we must look to God's book. A few years ago, Time Magazine featured a story about Peter Sellers. It told about him appearing on The Muppet Show and being interviewed by Kermit the Frog. By the way, you can Google that and you can watch that episode. His interview began with Kermit telling Peter Sellers, now just relax and be yourself. Peter Sellers responded, I can't be myself because I don't know who I am. The real me doesn't exist. Now, we suppose that Peter Sellers was trying to be funny because he was a comedian by trade. But on this particular occasion, his words were anything but funny. In fact, they were rather sad. One of his longtime friends commenting on those words said, Poor Peter. The real Peter disappeared a long time ago. What he is is simply an amalgamation of all the stage and screen characters he has ever played. Now he is frantically trying to unsnarl that mess and find out who he really is. Do we know who we really are? The Bible answers that question for us. 